The next subject we're going to discuss is the radical addition reactions of HBr, hydrobromic acid. When I take HBr and react it with an alkene, I typically get an addition reaction where I add the hydrogen to the least substituted carbon, I add the bromine to the most substituted based on Markovnikov addition rules. If I take one butene and HBr, but I throw in some peroxide into my solution, I get the hydrogen adding to my most substituted hydrogen and my bromine to the least substituted. In other words, I get an anti-Markovnikov addition. With a little bit of research, I find out that these peroxides actually generate radicals. So this is a radical reaction that undergoes anti-Markovnikov addition. Let's look at the mechanism for that. So here's a peroxide, a very reactive species, especially if I heat it up or in the presence of light. My peroxide tends to undergo homolytic cleavage to form these alkoxy radicals, which behave in a similar way to both my alkyl radicals and my halogen radicals. These alkoxy radicals then can react with the HBr in my reaction vessel to form a new bond between my oxygen and hydrogen and homolytically cleave to form a bromine radical. Okay, That bromine radical then can react with my alkene double bond to form one of the electrons in my pi bond will form a new bond with the bromine radical that is formed. And then I form a radical and that it goes on to react with the hydrogen bromide in solution to form a new bond between the carbon and the hydrogen. Notice here that in this case, I've shown the radical as a secondary radical. That's because the secondary radical is more stable than the primary. So in this step here, I could either have formed my radical here on the terminal carbon of the alkene or the internal carbon of the alkene. The one that's internal is more stable. So that's why this process of taking HBr with some peroxide and an alkene gives me anti-Markovnikov addition of HBr across that double bond. There's also a termination step here. So once I generate the bromine radicals, they could recombine to form bromine gas. My bromine radical could, could react with my alkyl radical to form this dibromo compound, or my radicals could combine with another terminal radical to form this larger molecule that's also dibrominated, but now has eight carbons in it. These are all termination steps, but we still have the termination steps of bumping into contaminants, bumping into the reaction vessel walls to terminate this process. If I take an alkene and I react it with HBr in the presence of peroxide, I get anti-Markovnikov addition of HBr across that double bond to put my bromine out here on the end carbon. These reactions do not undergo rearrangement because there is no carbocation intermediate. That is one benefit to a, a radical-based chemical reaction. How about other hydrogen halides. It turns out that this effect only works for hydrogen bromide. If I were to take an alkene and HCl and peroxide, I actually get Markovnikov addition, which is the normal addition. If I were to take an alkene and HI in the presence of a peroxide, I still get normal addition, normal meaning Markovnikov addition of HI across that double bond. Let's look at the rationale for that. We can look at the thermodynamics of these reactions to explain why HBr actually goes anti-Markovnikov addition, while HCl and HI do not undergo radical anti-Markovnikov addition. If I look at the propagation steps for bromine radical reacting with an alkene, I see that both of them 
are actually exothermic reactions. The first one here is exothermic by 9 kilocalories per mole. The second one is exothermic by 14 kilocalories per mole. All of my termination steps are actually exothermic also because they're only bond forming. There's no bond breaking in my termination steps, but they're not as exothermic. So these reactions are actually favored. If I look at the thermodynamics of, of radical reactions of chlorine and iodine, I find out that one of the propagation steps is actually endothermic. In other words, they cannot compete with exothermic reactions of termination. They would rather have, if a radical is formed, these would rather terminate than react together to form my complete radical chain reaction. The same thing's true here for iodine radical. One of my reaction steps of my propagation reactions is actually endothermic, so it's not favored thermodynamically. Therefore, it does not compete with termination, and it would rather terminate. So when I react HCl and HI with an alkene, the radical initiator, the peroxide, doesn't do anything, and I just add normally. I just add across that double bond in Markovnikov addition. How about stereochemistry for HBr addition? I actually, because I'm going through a radical again, I am going to have stereochemical consequences. And in fact, I see that I get a racemic mixture of products. So in this case, I'm going to, let's see, I have HBr, I have peroxide, I have an alkene. I'm going to add the hydrogen to the most substituted and I'm going to add the bromine to the least substituted. I form a pair of enantiomers because I'm undergoing going through a radical intermediate where I could attack from the top side or from the bottom side. Let's do a practice exercise where we're going to show the mechanism for taking this alkene, one methyl cyclohexane, and converting it into one bromo, one methyl cyclohexane. If I look at this, I want to first determine if that is Markovnikov addition or anti Markovnikov. Let's see, I've added the hydrogen to the least substituted and the bromine to the most substituted, so that would be Markovnikov addition. So I could accomplish this by just taking HBr forming my carbocation intermediate, which is very stable, and reacting with bromine to form this tertiary alkyl halide. How about if I wanted to form the anti-Markovnikov product? In other words, 1-bromo-2-methylcyclohexane. In that case, I'm just going to add some peroxide to my reaction vessel to form the radical process where my tertiary radical now is more stable than the secondary, and then I add the hydrogen to the most stable radical here. Anti-Markovnikov addition of HBr across a double bond. Let's do another practice exercise where we convert 1-methylcyclohexanol into 1-bromo-2-methylcyclohexane. Let's see, my functional group here, my hydroxy group, is actually on my tertiary carbon, where in my product, my bromine is on a secondary carbon, one away. So thinking about that, if I could just make this into an alkene, I'm going to make that carbon also reactive. So let's do an elimination reaction, throw in some sulfuric acid, form the alkene, and then I'm going to take HBr with some peroxide to form the addition reaction in the anti-Markovnikov direction. Acid catalyzed dehydration or elimination, anti-Markovnikov hydrohalogenation reaction or an addition reaction. Let's now look at some other radical reactions and let's look at allylic and benzylic radicals. If I look at an allylic radical, 
It's actually a fairly stable radical because I can draw resonance structures. If I move one electron at a time, moving the electron and this carbon down between those two carbon atoms and one of these electrons, I form another radical. These are resonance structures. Whenever I draw resonance structures, I think stable. So allylic radicals are actually very stable. The same thing is true with benzylic radicals. If I form the benzylic radical and I start to move electron around, electrons around one at a time, I can form five resonance structures, which means benzylic radicals are actually very stable. Let's look at the stability of benzylic and allylic radicals relative to tertiary, secondary, primary, vinyl, and methyl. You can see here benzylic are the most stable because I can draw resonance structures. Allylic are approximately the same because I can draw uh, resonance structure. Tertiary radicals are stabilized by these three alkyl groups. Secondary radicals are stabilized by two alkyl groups. Primary radicals are stabilized by one alkyl group. And they're much stabler than my vinyl or a methyl radical. So in general, if I take a molecule where one of my carbon-hydrogen bonds is benzylic, that's the most likely to react because I'm going to go through a reaction intermediate that is more stable. So here I take a halogen, either bromine, chlorine, or iodine in the presence of UV light or a peroxide. I get exclusively near 100% the substituted benzylic alkyl halide, where my halogen is on my benzylic carbon atom. So let's look at some chemical reactions sort of in review. If I take an alkene, react it with just HBr, I get Markovnikov addition of HBr across that double bond. If I look at an alkene and I react it with HBr in the presence of a peroxide, I get anti-Markovnikov addition. If I take an alkene and I react it with bromine gas, I just get addition of bromine across that double bond, getting mostly syn addition. If I now look at an alkene and bromine gas, but I reduce the concentration of bromine gas to very, very low concentrations, and I actually add some peroxide, I actually get allylic substitution reactions, where I get addition of bromine in the allylic position one carbon away from the double bond. One way to generate bromine radicals in very low concentrations is to react an alkene with something called N-bromosuccinamide, or abbreviated NBS, and that gives me a lilic addition of my bromine to my alkene. The two mechanisms on how that occurs is that if I NBS undergoes homolytic cleavage to form this nitrogen radical and my bromine radical, and then that bromine radical is produced in very low concentrations, so it reacts in the allylic position, the most stable radical place to react. Another way to generate bromine in very low concentrations is to take NBS, react it with some HBr, which forms bromine, which then reacts with peroxides to form bromine radicals. Again, these reagents are actually very easy to control in very low concentrations, producing my radical bromine in very low concentrations, NBS. Let's look how we can actually selectively brominate allylic or benzylic carbons. And we're going to do that by using NBS, N-bromosuccinamide. So I look at two examples here. In this molecule, I have two allylic 
carbons with allylic hydrogens. If I react that with NBS in low concentrations, add a little bit of light or a peroxide or heat it up gently, I tend to form in high concentrations the allylic alkyl halide. One carbon removed from the alkene. I do not add HBr across that double bond and I don't add Br to one of these carbons right here. If I look at a benzylic carbons, which would be this one right here, it has three benzylic hydrogens, I can react it with NBS also to form the benzylic alkyl halide. Let's now look at the reaction mechanism in another example of NBS reacting to form an allylic alkyl halide. If I take MBS plus HBr and H nu, that generates Br dot in very low concentrations. Reacting that with an alkene, I want to form the most stable radical. Those are going to be my allylic radicals. I have two of them that are in resonance with each other. In a second step, I add Br, bromine gas, to this step, and that reacts with that halogen to form the allylic alkyl halide and the bromine radical, again in very low concentrations, which goes on again to react with an alkene. Let's look at another example of using MBS to form the allylic alkyl halide. If I take MBS plus HBr and add some light or a peroxide or some heat, That'll form my bromine radical. It reacts with my alkene to form the most stable radical intermediate. So here I have a tertiary allylic. Here I have allylic. I then can react with some more bromine gas that I put in my reaction vessel to form this allylic tertiary alkyl halide and my allylic alkyl halide. This I form in much higher concentrations than this one because this radical is more stable. 